Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the 38th Space Symposium. My name is Rich Cooper with Space Foundation. We are thrilled to be able to, uh, as we start symposium, uh, to do a program like this in front of a live audience. Um, for those of you who are new to Space Symposium, welcome. For those of you who are returnees, welcome back. Uh, for those who are returnees, I think you're going to see we've got even more programming uh, going on than we have ever had before, and I can assure you with all of that programming, you're going to get lots of steps. So we want you to enjoy all of that and, um, and, and again, enjoy today's program. Uh, what we at Space Foundation do, we look to be the premier leader in information education and collaboration amongst the global space ecosystem. And one of the ways that we look to do that is by bringing together leaders like what we have today to talk about some of what those space policy issues are. And needless to say, there are a lot of them. But when we have done, and over the past several years, we've started the Space Matters program online, and we've been fortunate to have these panelists and a few others that have come in and been part of that dialogue. Because this goal of Space Matters has been to share with you the informed and insightful insight that people need to have to what's going on in today's space. So in doing that, we decided to find the four most quiet, unassuming individuals you could possibly find in the space community. And that would be an absolute, that is not true at all because we found four people who really know their stuff and have some great experience of which to share and look forward to sharing that with you, but then also hearing from you with the Q&A that we're looking to have. And with that Q&A, the way we're asking you to do that, if you've got this form here, there is a number for you to text that question and Leslie Kahn will be down here and we'll offer those questions uh, at the, towards the close of our program. But let me introduce uh, our four stellar panelists. The gentleman from Pennsylvania, the Honorable Robert Walker, former chairman of the House Science Committee. Carissa Christensen, CEO and founder of Bryce Tech. Patricia Cooper, president and founder of Constellation Advisory, LLC. And the gentleman to my right, the Honorable Jim Bridenstine, former Oklahoma Congresswoman and former NASA Administrator. And with those folks, please join me in welcoming them. There's more information about all of those speakers on the Space, uh, space Symposium uh, website, spacesymposium.org. You can take a look at that, get their bios and their details. But before we get some things rolling, we're gonna do a little, just a brief scene setting here before we let these panelists do what they do best, and that is inform, educate, and connect people to what's happening in space. Recent polling by Yahoo News and YouGov indicates that Americans do not fully grasp the benefits of space and are divided on whether space exploration missions are worth it. The poll indicated that 40% of Americans agreed that space missions are, they agreed that space missions are a good use of taxpayer money, while 36% well, stated it was not. In addition, in addition, 50% of respondents from the poll stated that they're excited by the possibility of returning to the moon, while again, 36% said they were not. Our panel of experts gonna, is gonna take this on uh, as we lead off, but again, this is an audience of the people who already believe in space. So as I kick this off with this panel, if you panelists had to write a memo to the non-space enthusiast or the non-space vested community, and there are some out there, what would you put in that memo? Sir, start with you. Well, your everyday life depends upon it. You can't pump gas. You can't uh, use your uh, credit cards. You can't uh, do uh, much of anything these days without going through space. And so it really matters to everybody in their lives. Well, uh, I think instead of a memo, I'd probably do a video. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and to Bob's point, absolutely. Uh, we all know that space capabilities are directly relevant uh, to day-to-day -day life. Uh, we all know that um, space capabilities are directly relevant to our national security. We all know that space capabilities and space activities have uh, resulted in technology advances directly and indirectly that affect uh, an enormous range of in uh, industries from electronics to communications to, to healthcare. Um, I think what often gets lost in these discussions is imagine if I said to, if we did a survey and we said, 
do you support ocean industries? Well, snorkeling, <laughs> uh, oil rigs, uh, cruise ships, uh, nuclear submarines. So we're getting to the point where the space, space, the space industry is equally diverse. You know, the, the incredible breadth of capability. And I think that's a piece that really gets lost in broader discussions about space, that it's not simply exploration. Wonderful though exploration is, it's a whole range of technologies, capabilities, and businesses. Yeah, I, I'd agree. From my corner of the space world, which is more on the communication side, that it is really not very hard to show value. But I think, uh, and in fact, there are a couple new technologies that are likely to intensify the general public's awareness and appreciation of satellites in flight broadband. Some people love it, some people hate it. Everyone knows it's happening. And these new proposals to do satellite to cellular, I think will again give a chance for the average citizen to become reminded that space is a part of that ecosystem. We almost have um, a problem of excess success in the communication satellite world where, th where something that was more remarkable at one point becomes mundane and not appreciated. Every time there was a remote television interview, it was a big Chiron at the bottom, live via satellite. Now it's old hat, they don't even mention it. Or GPS, which is, I think, very few people appreciate the space architecture that supports the everyday services that we use. So there's maybe a little bit of a tipping point where we need to bring those utilized services back into kind of a, a space appreciation. But I had another slightly disjointed thought, but that's what we do on this group, um, which is one of the reactions, particularly in space exploration and civil space projects, I think is um, uh, a, a sense of uh, uh, fiscal efficiency uh, and the idea that the government is being a good steward of public funds in these programs uh, that are doing something that creates wonder, scientific value, and ultimately technology value. So I think that's something that NASA in particular has been really focused on, and I think that's a really valuable um, counterpoint. And for that, I pass to Jim. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> and we don't always agree, but on that, of course. Right. Um, let's see, the, the way we communicate, which of course is what you touched on, yeah. We think about rural Oklahoma. I come from Oklahoma. If you don't have internet broadband from space in a lot of places in Oklahoma, you're probably not going to have the internet at all. Of course, in-flight connectivity is important as well. But the way we communicate, and then you think about Dish Network, Direct TV, all of these things are adding value to people all over the globe all the time. But the way we communicate, the way we navigate, um, and by the way, that navigation piece, GPS, that also includes a timing signal, which is necessary for the flows of electricity on the power grid. So let's think about how important the power grid is to our lives. It regulates the flows of data on terrestrial wireless networks, so your cell phone is, is important there. Uh, you know, Bob mentioned you know, fueling stations. It's also important for every banking transaction. So all of our lives are touched every day by that timing signal from GPS, which explains why the enemies of the United States are developing capability to destroy those satellites, and we need to make sure that they understand that they will not gain an advantage over the United States by advancing those capabilities, which is what the Space Force is all about. But the way we communicate, the way we navigate, the way we produce food, the way we produce energy, the way we do disaster relief, national security, understand climate, um, and of course predict weather, these are all significant uh, capabilities delivered from space because of investments from the United States government. Um, I would also say that beyond that, when we think about going forward, what is the value specifically to human space flight? What is the value to microgravity, which we're only right now beginning to, to, to understand? We're at the tip of the iceberg. We've got an international space station that is, you know, maybe got 10 years left, not even 10 years left on its life. China has a brand new space station, um, and they're going around the globe taking the partners that we've had and trying to get them to join them on their, the Chinese International Space Station. So this, is, this becomes a, a geopolitical challenge as well. We want to make sure that the value of microgravity, the compounding of pharmaceuticals, the creating of immunizations, the you know, advanced materials, um, and, and, and 
all of these things are, are, are beneficial to the American economy. That's, one, that's why the United States government invests in these things. Um, and, and so we think about that. And of course, when you think about going to the moon and on to Mars, these are huge geostrategic decisions that our nation makes. Going back to the Cold War, um, you know, there was a day we initiated the Strategic Defense Initiative as a country. Uh, some people called it the Star Wars program to belittle it. Uh, that, that particular program we spent very little on. Um, but the, the threat to the United States at the time, the Soviet Union, uh, spent a lot of money trying to counter it. And the question is why? Well, they saw just 12 or 13 years before that humans walking on the surface of the moon. So when we develop these strategic capabilities, it has big implications for how the world perceives America in addition to the economic development impacts and all of the ways that it affects life on Earth as well. So there's a, you know, it's probably not a memo, it's probably more like a book if you wanna <laughs> think about it that but way. To, but to flip um, Patricia's point a little bit, when you cite the figures that you did in the polling, one of the reasons why you have trouble uh, justifying space is because people don't see it in, in all of this context. And so when the budgets are running out of control and the, the deficits are piling up and the debt's piling up, many people would say, well, one of the things we could probably give up is a space enterprise. And so it, and it, it just, it, just it, it makes no sense, but it's, it's, it's a part of the debate out there. If the question was, how much do you like electricity? <laughs> I think people would answer very differently. Right. So. Precisely. So I want to pull a thread that, that Patricia offered there about the fiscal aspect of things. The president's budget request recently was released. Lots of people have lots of thoughts on it. We're going to ask yours. When you take a look at the president's budget request, what does it say to you about what the investment should be or what they are not being? What are you seeing in the president's budget request that concerns you or needs to be changed or that you support? Chris, I'll start with you. Sure. Uh, so, you know, this budget request says, for sure, space matters, national security space matters, uh, civil space, space exploration matters. Uh, I'm struck that um, we're seeing this, uh, we've seen this, um, something that you might call continuity over the last three presidential administrations in that there has been fairly robust and growing support for both national security and civil space. That arguable continuity has, you know, that trend is over top of some incredibly bloody battles and very painful, highly controversial decisions around the end of the shuttle program, uh, the the uh, cancellation of Constellation, the uh, move toward, uh, by NASA toward uh, commercial services to get to the space station. Uh, the uh, transition from the Air Force, into uh, the, a space uh, active Air Force, into the Space Force in a very short time frame, much shorter than I think anyone in the Pentagon would have said was reasonable. Um, so uh, to me, we're in this position where we're seeing growth in budgets, substantial growth in budgets, profound uh, opportunities for a, a continuation of the outcomes of those vicious battles. And it, it also raises the question to me, what's, what's the next vicious battle that's going to drive us to the next plateau? Patricia. So I'm no budget uh, uh, analyst, but it, two things strike me. One is, um, well, the first is that I think we're using the wrong metrics. We're used to looking at um, NASA budgets or DOD space budgets as our bellwether of how important space is. And I think space has become so diffused across so many different aspects. We need to be looking more widely through the budget to understand um, if we're going to try and assess it as a tool um, on space's value, we've got to be looking much more far, we've got to be looking farther afield um, than just those more traditional elements in the budget. Um, and I haven't seen that kind of analysis, and I, I think it would be a useful uh, kind of look back to see how DHS and uh, uh, you know, uh, Department of Agriculture, other agencies are starting to employ space content, space resources, space connectivity, 
um, and invest in that way. The second point I'd say is also not a budget analysis, but a comment on it. Um, the dollar value is also perhaps not necessarily um, only a success if it goes up. Because the government's role, I, I have been a little bit of a student of the government's appropriate role in a whole bunch of space activities, communication space, national security space, um, imagery, launch, um, and the government's role when it changes from being an owner operator to a buyer of services or um, a, a stimulator of innovation, the, the budget points change considerably too. It is a less expensive enterprise to undertake those government activities than the more traditional owner operator activities. And so the budgets really need to be looked at in a slightly different way. That having been said, I haven't done it. So. <laughs> Oh, I, I, so I think, I think Patricia is absolutely spot on. When you consider how the government is now stimulating private sector, whether it's NRO doing an IDIQ contract to buy synthetic aperture radar data, or any data for that matter, and, and it's not just NRO, but um, other government agencies uh, doing the same thing, uh, that, that has a, that, so yeah, you take a little bit of government money, you add to it a whole lot of private capital, and you start developing these capabilities and you start buying data and that data is then not just sellable to the government, it's sellable to commercial industry and international partners and all of a sudden the cost gets spread way out and you can deliver a whole lot more for a whole lot less. And so looking at that, and by the way, these things uh, were the brainchild of the gentleman at the end of the row down there, Bob Walker, who was way ahead of his time on all this commercial stuff. Um, back in what, the 1940s or something? <laughs> the 30s to the 40s. 30s and 40s. Um, so as chairman of the science committee, Bob was, Bob was key on trying to push all this long before it was popular, and it's still maybe not popular among some segments of the space market. Um, but no, I, I think Patricia's just right. We, we have to think of it entirely. I will also say, if the NASA budget request takes us up 7.5%, which I think is about what it was, that's flat given the, the inflationary environment that we're in. So we need to really think about what, what is a budget increase and what is flat. Yeah, I would go to that. Is, uh, one of the things I worry about is when we talk about the space programs, uh, the administration comes out with their budgets. They brag about the fact that they're putting more money than ever into space. The problem is that inflation uh, has eaten away at that, and it's really not the kind of spending that we need to have. We need massive investment in a lot of this uh, because of the challenges that we face all over the world. So whether it's in the military or in uh, NASA or other agencies that are now heavily involved in space, we're not seeing the kinds of investment I think we need. Now, I'll tell you a story from back in those days in the 40s. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, one of my colleagues and I invited uh, some young NASA engineers up to the hill to tell us if you took just what they now know would be possible to do, um, what, what would those things be? And they gave us this, we, we spent three or four hours with them, and they gave us this whole outline of things that would be possible to do just with the technology we had had at that, at that time, and believe me, this was 30 years ago probably. Um, what we came out of that meeting understanding was there's no way the government will ever pay for all that. The only way you get there is to have the innovation of the commercial sector. That's when I started to move toward commercial space. Before we move to our next question, I want to remind everybody we are taking questions so that, again, if you take a look at the flyer we handed out to you and can text those, we will, we will get to those uh, shortly. But uh, let me give this last wrap-up question before we get into that Q&A. Uh, we've seen, we saw the poll results where people were at, we've seen the budget request where, where uh, the administration thinks we ought to be at. We've also seen where industry is at. This goes to the storytelling about space. Are we utilizing the entertainment and commercial industry enough to tell the space story? And if so, how do you think that ought to be used or do you think we're doing all right with it now? We're not. Okay. Should I take it? Please, take it. So um, not only are we not, we need to do a, a whole lot more. <laughs> um, 
So I think we need to make movies on the International Space Station, for example. I think that you know, it can fundamentally change the perception of young people towards science, technology, engineering, and math. When I was in the summer after my fifth grade year is when Top Gun came out. And I watched that movie. I knew at that point I was going to be a Navy pilot. I knew it. Um, and by the way, all of that happened. I, my parents had a different idea for me, but after I graduated from college, they had no say anymore. <laughs> And, but that's the kind of thing, it changes you know, what you think about what you want to do when you grow up. And I think if we were doing those kind of things, it'd be great um, to, to encourage the, you know, the young folks in this country to go into the STEM fields. I also think we need industry to, to do things that are outside the box. And I'll, I'll give you an example. When I was the NASA administrator, we had a shoe. It was Adidas, went up and they, they did an experiment on the International Space Station for how to make the sole of a shoe. Next thing you know, they're coming out with an Artemis shoe, and, the, and it's selling out within a day of, of coming out. And then, of course, after Adidas did it, Puma had to create a, a, you know, a NASA shoe as well. So these are things that I think are critically important to continue to advance the idea that you know, we can do stunning things in space and inspire the next generation. Yeah, the, the challenge I had at NASA, we had one experiment that went up to the International Space Station. It was a makeup experiment for Estee Lauder. Um, and I got called to the Senate to testify on what a waste of money that is. And I will tell you, that is not a waste of money. The goal is we need, we need customers in space that are non-traditional. And if people are willing to spend money to go to space to test new technologies, what does the microgravity do for this, that, or the other? And private companies are willing to pay for that. In my view, we ought to be encouraging that behavior, not discouraging that behavior. Um, and, and guess what? If one makeup company has success, the next one will want to, to repeat it. So yes, some of it, 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 when we think about commercial space, it's not just how we procure capability for the US government. It ought to also be, how do we find customers that are not the US government, way outside the box, box customers, and, and I, think, I think we have opportunity. We had Nickelodeon slime on the International Space Station. Um, these are all things that I think are important for our country. And, and, and there's really, really big money in that industry. Uh, with, with, with some former, <laughs> with, with some former uh, yeah. colleagues, I was out trying to sell a uh, television show in uh, Hollywood. And, you know, we weren't being very successful. And finally, uh, the guy who was traveling with us said, you understand, you're sitting across the table from someone who has to make a $25 million decision about whether or not to even get this into somewhere close to production. There's big money. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead, Chris. So um, let's talk about the customers for commercial space. Now, there are well-established markets like telecommunications with billions of customers. Uh, Quite a few of the sub-sectors of space that we're interested in as a community uh, are in early stage emergent uh, or essentially zero commercial customer modes. There's a vision, there's potentially opportunity, but there's not mass market. There are not mass markets. So uh, to follow up on Jim's comment on um, the International Space Station and R&D on the International Space Station. One of the hopes is, one of the hopes that we as a community have, is that that kind of R&D will lead to manufacturing at scale. That there will be a product manufactured in space for use ideally on Earth, where there is a very large potential market, maybe for use in space, but, but hopefully terrestrially. And that that product or those products will enable an ex a, a continuation of our low Earth orbit activities funded by a, a commercial economic ecosystem as opposed to primarily funded by government. So I would argue that on the storytelling side, one of our big gaps is that um, despite excellent efforts by many organizations, NASA among them, we're only engaging with a small number of companies. So 
Every makeup company is not on the International Space Station. Every pharmaceutical company does not have a research team thinking about the relevance of microgravity or other attributes of the space environment. We need to go from a few to many, many. And so how do you, how do you, how do you go along that, that continuum? How do you get to that large number of companies? And the reason you need a large number is because the odds are low. The probability of finding a successful product is low. We've, we've demonstrated that over 20 years of research, uh, 20 years of efforts. So to me, the story, the most important storytelling piece that, that we as a community are looking at right now is the one that characterizes the potential and energizes small investments by many, many organizations in diverse sectors to understand how the microgravity environment, how space attributes can potentially be beneficial to the products that they want to produce. Patricia. I think they're two different things. I think wonder is different than value. And wonder, we have in spades. Any, any one of you has told someone what you do, and the answer is, that's so cool. Uh, I don't know that we'll ever get to the same level of global participation in a space-related event that we did from the Apollo 11 launch, um, which was, I think, a sixth of the world's population watched. Extraordinary, given the state of television at the time. But the appreciation, the excitement, the uh, kind of tingles that come from space activities, I think we know how to do. And it's why we see the meatball everywhere on t-shirts from in unexpected quarters. It's why there are you know, kind of more space-related uh, sitcoms and uh, a common theme now in movies uh, than it had been 10 years ago. But that wonder we know how to develop because it's innate. What we haven't, I think, worked on is how to translate that wonder into a very concrete sense of value and utility that resonates with someone who appreciates space. And now you understand what it can do for you, not just how it makes you feel. Um, and that sort of childlike wonder is, is a really different um, facet than saying, I know that taking an experiment to the space station is going to result in some different uh, understanding of biology or agriculture or human physiology or some other manufacturing technique. So, uh, those, that I think is a different challenge. The other is this room has a great um, opportunity to try and step away from the vernacular that we use with each other, which is fun, um, and try and explain what we do in common terms to the people around us. Um, my sister's a nuclear engineer and she used to tell me that I would never understand what she did, um, which I could. But um, <laughs> it wasn't that hard. She didn't like the Homer Simpson analogy. But the, the, the challenge was to say, you know, what do you do? What do you do and why does it matter? And we all have really good stories to tell. And whether we're telling it to our families and our friends and our colleagues and the people that sit next to us on planes or whether we're telling it in larger platforms, um, it's a challenge for us to think, to extrapolate the practical thing that we do every day and the really complicated you know, jargon that we use to talk to each other and pull out the, the utility of it because we already have the wonder. I was at a lunar conference with mining companies and uh, there was a lot of discussion about mining regolith. Mm -hmm. And finally, one of the terrestrial yeah. mining people said, do you mean digging sand? Is that, is that what you're talking yeah. about, digging yeah. sand? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. To your point. Yeah. With that, now it's your turn. We're going to get to your questions here right now. Leslie Kahn uh, leads uh, within Space Foundation, uh, the Symposium 365 program, uh, does a lot of our programming, but she also leads the Space Report team, which I hope all of you have had a chance to pick up a copy. A new issue was issued this past week. But uh, Leslie, you've got the questions from the audience. Fire away. Okay, thank you. What is the biggest near-term government regulatory or legislative issue that must be handled this year? Go for it. They've got to figure out. Um, they've got to figure out space safety. What expectations is the U.S. government going to place upon space operators to safeguard their own infrastructure and to operate in a way that safeguards others' infrastructure, um, the space environment for other future development, and 
um, life and property on Earth. We have a very good sense of, um, of the uh, sort of analytical piece of this, but the diffusion of authority across different agencies has made a, a really a, a more complicated than it should have been to solve that problem. Bob? Well, uh, in my mind, uh, that's absolutely co uh, correct. We need to get uh, something done about uh, the fact that the orbits are soon to be clogged uh, by uh, debris and, and everything else. But there's also the need uh, to transfer the uh, regulatory authority to the Commerce Department uh, for uh, handling all this. Uh, the problem is a fight on Capitol Hill that's been going on now for uh, almost two decades uh, between a couple of committees. We've got to stop that and, and get the job done. Jim? I, I, would, I would say I think the Article 6 of the Outer Space Treaty, the authorization and continuing supervision of activities in space is something for which there is right now a lot of uncertainty and it puts a chilling effect on capital markets. So when we think about things like mining the moon or digging dirt on the moon, um, when we think about those type of activities or rendezvous and proximity operations in low Earth orbit or even commercial human habitation that is not owned and operated by the government, um, who does the authorization and continuing supervision of these activities uh, which is required under the Outer, Outer Space Treaty. Right now there is nobody, and, and the agencies that would have that are not being funded at the levels necessary to put those elements in place. So I think that's another area. But I do agree with Patricia wholeheartedly that the whole space uh, you know, debris issue is, is gonna be a challenge going forward. Marissa. Uh, space traffic management, number one, without mm -hmm. a doubt. Next question. Okay, our next question. During the Apollo years in the 1960s, for those of us who don't remember, NASA's budget was nearly 4% of US GDP. When Mr. Bridenstine was NASA administrator, he had a budget of a fraction of a percentage of the GDP. What would be enough investment in space by the federal government? Just so you know, it went up under my watch. I want to put that on the record. <laughs> I'm going to leave it to these to answer that one. Okay. Well, uh, look, I think the opportunity rests not so much in um, uh, how much money uh, NASA gets. I clearly think that they need more money than they have. And one reason we, why we put together the National Space Council or renewed it uh, was to begin to see where NASA pl could play a bigger role in the broader aspects of uh, space. Uh, but we're going to re be more and more reliant upon the commercial sector, and we are going to have to invest uh, the money that the government spends in buying services and buying uh, technology uh, from the commercial sector. Yeah, it, so uh, I'd be you know perfectly happy with one percent as a target. I think that's quite reasonable. I will tell you what comes to my mind when we talk about this is the amount of money that we are wasting with committee disputes over what is essentially a conceptually solved problem. Everyone, you know, there, there's a pretty clear path forward. The money we are wasting uh, over um, partisan, in, intramural disputes within the Space Force, within the services, among defense agencies, concern over uh, owning hardware versus buying services driven by factors other than what is the best value to serve the mission. To me, that's the, the, the real value, the real gain, the real benefit is not increasing the budget, it is improving uh, how we perform in those arenas. I think I'd also look at the programs that have had a really significant bang for buck. I think Commercial Crew is a good example of that, very controversial at its time, but I think uh, un, uh, unassailably successful in terms of value. I think uh, commercial cargo as well. Uh, you know, those are those are models where money put against a problem in partnership with industry have yielded far more value to NASA and the space enterprise overall than I think anyone would have thought. So, uh, you know, finding that lightning in a bottle is is I think a good objective for NASA. The other I would say is, um, you know, I referred to this kind of diffusion of 
authority across many agencies, the FAA, the FCC, NOAA, Office of Space Commerce, you know, the, wherever those regulatory responsibilities lie, um, I have seen time and time again that NASA's expertise, their deep, deep expertise in technical issues, puts it in the role of being um, a, a technical agency uh, that is uh, participating in these decisions or advising. And I think that's another um, role that probably should be recognized for NASA that has been ad hoc in the past. And it's probably a workforce and, um, and budget shift a little bit. It's not big money, but it's important. I would add a couple of things on that question. Um, when you talk about a percentage of federal spending that is the NASA budget, there's two elements to that. One is the NASA budget. The other is federal spending. Yeah. So if you're going to start doing percentages of federal spending and you go back to the 1960s, you look at Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, and how much we were spending on those programs in the 1960s compared to today. Um, and, then, and then you look at discretionary non-defense spending. Uh, I'm telling you, it's, it's not so much that NASA's budget has shrunk, it's that the federal government has grown. And now I'm putting on my congressional hat, maybe not my NASA hat so much. Um, but but that's, that's got to be considered when you look at what the NASA budget is. To Patricia's point, thank you for acknowledging commercial crew, commercial resupply. Obviously, Bob fought those fights back in the day. Um, and they came to fruition, and now people are realizing the value of that. But when, when I was the NASA administrator, we, we put into place um, you know, commercial lunar payload services mm -hmm. to go to the moon commercially, the commercial human landing system, uh, what has now become the commercial EO destinations program. All of these are you know, the purpose of which um, is, is to say, look, we can rely on the whimsical budgets of politicians or we can actually out-innovate and out-entrepreneur communist China. And I think we ought to be doing that. Next question. Well, I thank you. This is a perfect segue. Our next question, how do we ensure the U.S. maintains strong bipartisan support for the commercial low Earth orbit destinations, the space stations, and all of the research capabilities as the ISS reaches its end of life? I guess I have to take that one. You got to get the first hit. This is the NASA. This is the NASA hearing here. <clears throat> um, okay, uh, commercial Leo destinations critically important for the country. Here's what we know: the ISS, as much as all of us love it, it cannot last forever. Um, it has been extended through 2031 by Congress. NASA has said they've got a plan to end it in 2030. Um, here's what here's what we need to understand: we are not going to build as a nation, another international space station. So we have got to get commercial LEO destinations accelerated, and yes, that is a strong public-private public partnership, um, and, and, and not just commercial LEO destinations. I don't want to leave out Axiom. Critically important, they're building habitation module to be attached to the International Space Station. Um, but all of these capabilities need to be accelerated. Here's what we risk. We risk having no humans in low Earth orbit or none on our own space stations, and at the same time, China having a brand new space station, and all of the capabilities that we as the United States have developed over the course of decades, all of these capabilities are now gonna be basically handed over um, to our biggest competitor in the world. And I think that would be an enormous mistake for the United States of America to, to turn that over. What does that mean? Um, that means we need, we need public-private partnerships, we need Congress to fund those, at much higher levels earlier, and we need to make sure that there is no gap. We saw what happened, it was alluded to earlier with the space shuttles, there was a gap. We, we retired the space shuttles and we didn't have commercial crew ready to go, we were dependent um, on Russia for a period of you know nine years before we got commercial crew going. We do not want to put ourselves in a position like that again, and by the way, we did the same thing after Apollo. We, when Apollo was over, we, we had an eight year gap before we had space shuttle. These are important capabilities for our country. It's gonna require action from Congress. It's not happening yet. Yes, they are supportive, but they're not supportive at the levels necessary to prevent that gap from happening. Uh, I would uh, expand on that. I 100% agree that it is uh, vitally important for the US to have a sustained presence in LEO and to have a human uh, presence in LEO. Uh, the pathway to develop commercial destinations and to 
foster the growth of commercial markets, in my view, uh, is a very shrewd one. However, it is not an absolutely certain zero risk pathway. So I think our posture from a policy standpoint for durable support must be not, we will have a commercial Leo, pre we will have a Leo presence if there are uh, robust commercial markets. Our policy must be, we will have a lunar, uh, a um, Leo presence, period. We are pursuing a path as stewards of taxpayer resources and seeking economic growth that will foster and facilitate the growth of commercial markets. Whether that is fabulously successfully, successful, partially successful, or minimally successful, we will, as a nation, have a presence in Leo. Jim, uh, if one of the things that you mentioned on Axiom, uh, you probably know more about this than I do, but I think what part of their plans is to detach their modules and use them as a commercial space station uh, after the space station uh, goes out of orbit. Patricia, any light the thoughts? Yeah, I would just say I think it's a, it is a, a reassurance after that sort of troubling note, and understandably troubling, that there are so many companies that have both uh, the conceptual technical approach, but also are gathering financial wherewithal to be able to participate. That is a unique a phenomenon in our country, in this country, that I don't think you would find in, in many other counterparts. That is a reassurance for us. Um, I think one of the roles that, um, that we in the space industry, certainly um, the government has, is to um, continue to underscore how useful that can be how uh, stable a partner the U.S. government will be with those commercial ventures so that they can continue to uh, gather the resources and continue to innovate their, their projects that we actually have something at the end of the road. Um, I think we need to be able to describe the values, as we talked about earlier, of, of human presence in, at, at LEO in a way that, that resonates differently than uh, the ability to do a joyride. And, and there's, there's so much richness there to be able to pull on, but we need to be able to characterize it in a way that, that resonates and, and supports the pathways that, uh, you know, as many of these programs that are being commercially driven uh, can, can pursue. I think we've also, we've gotten a little US centric and I think we're all perhaps using a bit of shorthand. I, I certainly am uh, about uh, US presence when what that really means is uh, coalition presence, yeah. ally pr presence of of like-minded countries who are working together to enable uh, a, a shared presence, a shared capability that is relevant to our future in space. With that, ladies and gentlemen, we're coming in here for a landing, so I get to take the moderator's prerogative, and I get to you know have two quick lightning round questions. Uh, they don't know the other one that I was going to give them, but I uh, gave them a heads up on this: Star Wars or Star Trek. We'll start with you. I'm going to go with uh, Spaceballs. <clears throat> um, we all have our favorite characters. Mine is Barf the Mog. He's half man, half dog. He's his own best friend. Um, and I, uh, I felt that way a lot when I was the NASA administrator. <laughs> I mean, how do you follow that, right? How do you follow that? I was a Star Trek girl. I'm not going to do the, they shot my hair impression <laughs> um, from Spaceballs. You're, you've got to go watch this movie. Uh, I'm, I'm going to veer completely off. I, I, Artemis has brought me back to uh, the, the Moon is a Harsh Mistress. I reread that recently, and it just resonates so much right now. So uh, I'm Star Trek. I got my flip phone. I'm waiting to get my transporter. <laughs> Last question. When we landed on the moon the first time, we had a lander called Eagle. When Artemis returns to the moon, what would you name the lander? That's like a committee decision. <laughs> So the astronauts do the naming of those vehicles, and I'm going to leave it at that. I'm going to defer to the astronauts. <laughs> yeah. I, I think the Artemis and the Owl, uh, Owl is not a very exciting name, but maybe there's a, maybe there's a more dramatic uh, 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 species of Owl, but I think that wisdom and that vision, 
I think there's something nice about that. As a Rice grad, I second that hoot. <laughs> <laughs> Bob, anything? Uh, I'm with Jim. Uh, the astronauts have done a great job of that over the years, and uh, we ought to let them uh, name their spaceships. With that, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming and thanking this panel again. That's fun. If you want to see this program again, or you really enjoy this program, and you, and you see somebody here that, you know, you missed something really great, this program will be available on the Symposium 365 website. If you go to this QR code here at the very, very bottom, that will take you to the Symposium 365 website where you will be able to see this. But here's the other thing. This team does, this team does Space Matters every month. And again, uh, would love to have you guys as viewers. You can find more information about that on the Symposium 365 site. We are grateful to the panel. We are grateful to you. And thank you for joining Space Matters. Great.